Good evening. Good evening, everyone. We, we've made it to our, our next keynote, and we've done an amazing job. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you. Thank you to everyone who has participated. I know that it's been an amazing long day, and we've learned a lot, and we've pushed ourselves. So I'm very, very grateful. So we can give ourselves a hand of applause before we. Great. So we have um, now the wonderful opportunity uh, to hear from a woman who really is um, a, a mother figure to many of us um, on the continent, really is an example of um, sacrifice, sacrificial leadership. And um, it gives me great, great pleasure um, to welcome uh, Grasa Michelle to the stage, um, who's going to share with us um, about how a lot of the work that she has been doing and continues to do uh, breaks the frameworks in so many ways. Um, and one thing that's also just incredible about this woman is that she is so very humble and so very open. Um, and what she said to me as soon as we met is she wants to hear from you. Um, and so this will be um, as interactive as we possibly can make it. Um, and <laughs> um, yes, and it's going to be a, a reunion for, for some. Um, so without any further ado, um, I welcome to the podium uh, Madame uh, Grassa Michel. Thank you. I think I'll need you. Some more. Good afternoon. Uh, let me start by thanking really the organizers who uh, convinced me to come uh, because I am always very nervous when I have to speak to luminaries like you. And I feel a bit uh, intimidated. So my protection is to say, oh, no, I'm very busy. I can't make it. It's, it's, it's simply because I'm not so sure how to, to, to really to make inputs which can be of interest to, one, to young people. You know, young people are so challenging. And uh, young people in institutions like this who are, let me say, will be creme de la creme. So... I want to lower your expectations. That's my beginning, to lower your expectations about what I'm going to say. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, it's, uh, it's late in the day. You have listened to, uh, I mean, presentations of uh, substance. So I'll try to be very short so that we'll have much more time to uh, to talk about what is of interest for you. So uh, you asking questions. Rachel, I left my paper. Sorry. Mm -mm. The, the theme today is how, uh, to, how to, to frame Africa in uh, our days. I want to begin by saying Many people think that uh, the developments in the U.S. and the developments in this country and even the rise of the, 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 the right wings in Europe, it's a disaster. Perhaps it's a disaster for them, but I think for Africa it's a good thing. It's a good thing because... Uh, we have been socialized to think that the model of democracies are the ones which are being developed in those countries. So we aspire to, and we imitate even, what in structures, in processes, and in the way we believe that is the model of democracy. When the foundations of that model are being shaken as they are, then we are forced to say, ah, oh, it doesn't look like it's that good. There are things which are not right. And because now we begin to question, 
we are forced to look into ourselves. So this is a good time for Africa to break really with the mentality of uh, dependence on our colonial masters and to begin a process in which we look inwards, we rediscover our own values, our own institutions, our own philosophies, our own structures of how we organize society, and to say, what is it which we have to stand on, but also what is it what we have to offer to the rest of the world? Because we seem to be assimilating and receiving, but what is it we can give? And I will leave you with this, actually, because I think it's a, it's a, it requires a little bit more of research to say, what has been the contribution of Africa to development of the global family? And it's not necessarily to talk of uh, uh, slavery. Uh -uh, it's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> not that it's, it's, it has not been, but it's because we know that already. And it was not in a relationship of equal to equal. What I, I'm, I'm asking you to question is, as sovereign peoples deliberately selecting who are our partners and why we select them, and what we have to give and we want to receive from them, in a process really of take and give you have to begin to do that. And particularly those of you who, in, who are in social science here. So I hope one day you will come back and tell me what did you identify. But I think also that, uh, you know, when you are having like in the so-called developed world, the, the closing of ranks and the closing of uh, even of borders, because of immigration, but which in essence, it shows a deep fear and suspicion of the other. You are forced to look back and say, but who am I as an African? We have been socialized, and this is how we live, particularly in our rural areas today, to say, I am because you are. Those of you who have had experience in rural areas, for you to invite somebody for a meal, just passing, you don't know who he is. It's just a human being. You invite. We have as a way of being, we as Africans, embracing, we don't suspect, we don't fear the others. On the opposite, we embrace them. So I think it is deep in the way we are, but we never put it as a philosophy of life. Please think of that. In a world where there's more and more rejection of the other, in a world in which more and more the other is seen as a threat, Africans have a golden opportunity to say there is another way of being human and to humanize the relationship, particularly those who are in need. So it sounds like, you know, people believe and they act mostly in terms of give and take in terms of hardware, we have software to offer. <laughs> and the software is more important, why? Because it's the best of what you become when you are beyond the material. And this is what Africans are able to give. The other example I could say today, you know, in terms of music, and arts, have you realized how much we have contributed to the rest of the world? And music, <coughs> it is that expression of uh, spirituality, of a human being as spiritual beings. And the best 
of music. Just think of jazz. Think of, we are everywhere. We are sitting in many of those lounges. Huh? But people even forget that this is of African origin. I want to suggest only, because I'm given very short time, that please sit down and enumerate those kind of things we Africans, we have been offering to the rest of the world. Now, because uh, we need to go quickly, I want to leave with you the reflection that part of failures in our development in the last 50 years has been because we did not take the time to reclaim our own identity. No one is going to stand firm, walk, and then run, and then fly if you are not rooted, you are not grounded. You young people, you are living in a world where you will have access to anything in the world in a question just of seconds. But you are also privileged in a way you have to be the best of how our citizens benefit for the discoveries of the 21st century, but we are rooted, we are grounded, we are proud of being ourselves. That ourselves has to be re, 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 rediscovered. And I'll give you just a bit of what we are trying to do. I'm associated to an organization called, called the Mandela Institute for Development Studies. And one of the objectives of what we want to do, it's exactly claiming our cultural heritage. Trying to identify ourselves not on the basis of what we have been told to be. The 54 countries which are in Africa have nothing, in many cases, really with who we are. You look at from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean, if you listen carefully to our languages, you will understand that we are exactly the same people and you will cross perhaps 10 countries which have been balkanized, but culturally, underneath, we are the same people. And we don't define ourselves on that basis. We define ourselves as Portuguese speaking, French speaking, English speaking. Why don't we say Yoruba speaking, Swahili speaking, and whatever? You know what I mean? It sounds a very, it, it, it sounds like I'm dreaming. But it, honestly, for you to s define yourself as an African, you need to go back and touch those roots. And to identify exactly why a child in Tanzania has too much to do with a child in, I'm calling you children, okay? To, a, a child <laughs> in Tanzania has a lot to do with a child in Nigeria, has a lot to do with a child in Senegal than what we believe because we have been told we are. And that is the kind of claiming who you are. And I don't, didn't have the time here to show you the map. Basically, there are only four, four big ethnic, if you want to call them, ethnic groups on the continent. If you talk of sub-Saharan African, only four. But we have been socialized to believe that we are all those differences. Let me move quickly on that. But I'm talking of reclaiming who we are and also being proud of offering to the rest of the world. Framing is the mentality of people to believe that African, African are rich in the way who they are. It's not about oil and gas and mining. It's about our humanity in a society where another element. We as African, our identity is collective. In many of our languages, we don't have much the I. We say we. And when you talk, 
particularly to an elderly person like me, because they believe that an elderly person is a result of a collective experience and wisdom which comes behind that person. You never address an elderly per person and say you in singular. Do you know that? Yeah, you say you, but it, for us, this you, it, it's, it's, it's a plural. But we have a community identity. And this is important in solidarity instead of the kind of mentality which you are being developed to say, it is about my success, it's about me, and because I'm brilliant, because I have the opportunities, and said, I, 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 I. Uh uh. In the world in which we go as Africans, we. And you will grow, you have to grow and thinking always on the collective. And even when you go to your profession, even you, whether you are in, in public space or you will be in private, you always think of we. You climb with others. You don't climb alone. Now, some of the examples of things we want, we, we try to reframe very quickly. The Grace Michelle Trust came to learn that uh, our continent has about 43% of children who are stunted. I'm sure you know what the stunting is. It means almost half of African children will not develop the full potential intellectually and sometimes even physically, but more importantly, intellectually, because they have been deprived of the right in nutrients, at particularly the age of a thousand days, thousand days from conception to two years. It is a hidden crisis. But it means that these children, even when they grow, their productivity is going to be lower. Their ability to grasp the concept, the very complicated concept of science which you are learning, they will never do it because they are damaged intellectually. So we decided to engage really seriously on issues of nutrition. And you'll say, but why nutrition? Because we take it not only as an issue of development, but particularly as the first investment for human capital development. Because when you give an opportunity a child to begin real in a good footing, then the rest of his or her life, it's open. It's simply opportunities. One thing we are doing. The other program I would very quickly also would like to, to, to mention is we realize also that, you know, in the, in, the, in the African context as well, we came to the story of dividing a child, a child in pieces as if is health, is education, is food, is water. A child is a whole. We miss the opportunity of developing a vision for the African child. And we are working and trying to say, who is the child we would like to have as the example of fully and integrally developed African child in the future? So that in programming, even government, you don't program only for health and food, etc. You program to achieve that integral part and harmonious part of what this child has to be. So we invest in future instead of only trying to deal with the immediate issues. I want to move now to women, because I've been working with women for many, many years as well. We have made some strides in the political sphere. But African women, most of them, you know this already, most of them, they are in the so-called informal, informal economy, which means their contribution it is only valued at a family level. But it, whatever you want to call it, GDP, I mean, the prosperity of what a nation is, they simply don't count. It's as if they are not doing anything. And we believe this is unjust. And at the same time, it is, we miss the opportunity of bringing to the formal economy 
the creativity, the energy. I mean, the, the, you, you name it how women even, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> in situations of poverty, they are the best managers because they manage to put food on the table every day. But that is not translated to formal economy as contribution. So two things we are trying to do. One, we have a network which we call New Faces, New Voices. We believe the first step for women to be in the formal economy is to have a financial identity, is to have what you can call a bank account. The moment she has a bank account, now she has the financial identity. And from that point on, what do we do is to support her from small to become medium and from medium. I won't describe in detail, but we have a program which one is financial inclusion, second is enterprise development, and then we have what we call, I mean, uh, women advancing Africa. Now where we will bring all, um, all, a representation of all sectors, different ages, to work together so that we build a movement. Our approach on this is networks. We don't work with individual as such. Why networks? Because we believe to change the status quo, no matter how you invest in one individual, but you are not going to remove barriers. So through networks, we build a movement, there are waves, and it together we identify the structural barriers which prevent women to participate fully in the formal economy. And we have, as we speak about, well, in New Faces, New Voices, we have 17, we are present in 17 countries. In another program, we, women in, in, in business, we are in 10 countries. Women in agribusiness, we are in six countries. And we establish even another um, network of women in the media. And I'm not going to describe this, but it's again about the narrative. Women to speak on their own behalf, telling their own stories so that we don't appear women, African women only, of those who are dying with HIV, those who are dying of those of poverty. We have other stories. So it's a, a question of balance, this story, and bring particularly young women who are doing fantastic things in changing, I mean, the, 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 the presence of women in the economy. If I can mention quickly, we also try to understand better the obstacles, and we do research. One of the, 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 the research we, we developed it was to understand who had women entrepreneurs. And in East Africa, so all the countries of East Africa, we interviewed, I mean, uh, e e e entrepreneurs. We learned first, they are very young, between 20 to 40 years. Second, they have, they are highly qualified, including in masters, etc. but they don't have assets to finance. Many of them, they started business on the basis of their own savings or family, et cetera, et cetera. They never had coaching, they never had mentorship, et cetera. Why we need to do this? We want to move from general statements and to understand exactly who our entrepreneurs, what are the issues they are facing, how we can work together with them to overcome them. Now, we have a tool which is going to help us precisely to understand the barriers, not only, and I told you that we have the network which is of a financial inclusion. I didn't mention that in Uganda alone, that financial inclusion, we started with the, in two districts and we brought into the system 250,000 women who had never had a bank account before. But with training which we are doing with them as well in different countries. So I just wanted to mention to you that for us, we go deep to try to understand what are the issues, who are the people, and how we can work with them in networks to move as, uh, as, uh, as waves. I wanted also to touch very quickly on the fact that when we talk of uh, African development, many people they think, as I mentioned, on oil and gas and mining. All these things are very important. But it, 
Take an example, for instance, of Tanzania, northern Tanzania. Last year, in a meeting of agriculture, they realized that rural people are producing beans and they are exporting to eight African countries. What does it mean? Is that you can generate work, I'm not saying jobs, I'm saying work. You can transform rural areas, including in terms of access to market, and you can then break the barriers from one country to the other. Actually, when I say eight countries, it's in Africa, but they also are exporting out. They started to export abroad. What does it mean? Some people say that Africa is to become the basket of the world, right? And our way of doing this is not necessarily producing and consuming the same way some other countries now are facing issues of nutrition as the opposite. Our food is almost organic. And I think that's where Africa. When I say almost, it's because, yes, sometimes there's a fertilizer. One minute, yeah, I'll finish. <laughs> but it is to say there is an opportunity of Africa to feed itself and to feed the rest of the world without going exactly the same way of the genetically modified, et cetera, et cetera, which creates the kind of problem. That's an opportunity. And some of you here probably you are doing something in agriculture. So think about that. It's an opportunity to feed ourselves, to feed the world, but using different kind of techniques because we can have healthy food. The other example, Ethiopia is developing a huge program of industrialization. And as you know, Ethiopia doesn't have, I mean, uh, uh, oil and gas. It's on the basis of leather, the example of leather. Thousands of jobs, they transform it, they sell it, possibly some of you, you buy here in the UK. So we need to be creative in industrializing, taking into account those things which are at our advantage in our hand without necessarily depending as it is becoming for some of our countries, I mean, the curse of the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So framing the continent for us is not only talking about institutions, it's beginning from the bottom. As you could hear, the experiences which I'm sharing with you, at least our approach is from the bottom, is taking people, to gain a, a, a knowledge, getting assets to services, of course, but opening up their horizons and connecting with one another. And I want to leave you with this. You have a historic responsibility of shaping the Africa you want. Many times, we hear African young people complaining about all the things which I know they are happening. Institutions don't work, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. It is true, it is happening. But what I want you to, to really to be very clear, it's you and nobody else who is going to change that. It's your responsibility. Some of us, we had the responsibility, I mean, in our own way, which was not perfect, but it to bring our countries to freedom, okay? This second, this second struggle, freedom, this second liberation from poverty, from all those kind of things you know, it's your responsibility. So while you are here, in one of the best institutions in the world, you have to arm yourself, and fortunately, you come from many countries here. You build the crops of new leadership, which we need. Use the knowledge you have, but you plan what you want to see and where you want to see Africa in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time, and 20 years' time. I won't be there, but I'll watch you from down <laughs> in my grave. And that is important.
each one of you has to take that responsibility. And it is about we. And in that we, it's about those children who are starting. It's about those women who are still illiterate, those who are in informal sector. It's about the young people who do not succeed to come to an institution like this. Fred last night told, he is my boss, he's sitting there. Fred started this extraordinary initiative of establishing the Africa Leadership University. 25 campus on the continent with a methodology which is breaking a new ground. That's exactly what we have to do. So if you want, ask him more questions to explain. How do you break the frame? He is leading an initiative of building different kind of university in Africa, not only to imitate. So I leave you with that challenge, and I'm going to sit and listen to you. You ask the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mama Grassa. Um, in the interest of we, I mean, I'm so excited for this opportunity, but in the interest of we, I'm going to cede my moderated you know, question, and I'm actually just going to go straight into questions from the crowd because there's so much knowledge and so much to share, and I'm sure you, you all have questions. So, Sorry? Yeah, three at a time, sure. There's one So if we can start with the mic runner. Over there. Um, any more oh, hands? Thank you. Next is there. Any more? And one, one at the back. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for this very enlightening um, talk. My name is Harriet, and I'm studying the MBA here. I had a couple of questions. One was related to. We're just going to keep it at one, mm -hmm. just, okay. just in the interest. Yeah. All right, so you say that um, our value proposition at the global stage as Africans is our warmth, and we need to export that, uh, especially in this time can, where... Can you push the chair <laughs> a little bit? This young man here. Ah, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially in this time where uh, the, uh, the West is moving towards the extreme right. But I'm wondering how that would work out in practice. Does it involve uh, getting a bunch of warm Namibians and taking them to Trump land or Brexit land? How, how do we exploit that in practice? Yes. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Aida and I'm studying the Master of Public Policy and my question is about African women. So today we've talked a lot about the importance of African women in the African continent. And as an African woman, I was both, it's both very inspiring but, and troubling to me. It's inspiring because we recognize the power of women, but it's troubling because I feel like a lot of time we do lip service when we talk about including women in the African agenda. And what I mean by that is that we talk a lot about um, access to best basic education to our girls, but, but the reality is that we have a new generation of middle class educated African women joining the African continent and sometimes, and we need to be moving the conversation towards issues of like access to child care for our children when we're going to work or harassment. Those are issues that many of the young women are dealing. So my question is how do we complicate our understanding of the African women in the African continent? Uh, three? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Your Excellency, my name is Dumile from the Kingdom of Swaziland. A question that I have, um, uh, when during the opening of Parliament uh, with President Jacob Zuma, we, we saw a scene on TV where the youth reacted in not, um, in not such a, um, in a violent way because they wanted to express their opinion towards the President. And it required two female I could say mothers to actually have them kicked out out of the uh, parliament so that it could proceed. My question is from your own opinion as young Africans who could in the future perhaps be politicians, how do you think we can make ourselves more vocal without embarrassing ourselves on international media and mm -hmm. being res disrespectful to our elders even mm -hmm. if there is a political disagreement? Right. You put it already, but yeah. The, the first question was, uh, uh, 
I, I didn't I didn't want to I didn't mean exactly warmth when I said uh, our value system I, I, it's more than warmth I'm talking of you as an African always considering another human being with the value you respect and you see yourself in the eyes of that human being. And if you do that, you will never come to a point where, whether it's a marginalized person or it's a poor, or even in the case of uh, those who are, I mean, in this part of the world who are in need, you will treat them with dignity. What I'm trying to say is Africans have to beat and beat and beat again on the way of we as human beings, we have to respect the dignity of every single human being, whatever is the social status, whatever is the situation as that human being, to treat others with dignity. That's what defines your humanity. So it's not warm. The warm thing is like, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to... So it's a way, yeah, what, that's why I put it as a value system, right. as a philosophy of life. Is that even when you, for instance, when you become whatever you, you are doing MBA, you might be in a very prominent position wherever you are going to be. You will have to treat every single person, even those who are illiterate, who are, you treat them with dignity. And that's what I'm trying to say. And in our society today in 21st century, people have been monetarized. They are things. That sense of dignity doesn't exist. And that's what I want you to think about. And it's much profounder than just one. Yeah. The second thing is, oh, it's, a, it's like we talk always with the women integration in the economy, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds like it's a cliche. But let me tell you one thing, my daughter, is that while a woman cannot have the minimum of knowledge to be able to run her family, her business with dignity, even to be able then to have the strength and the ability to stand against harassment, what you were saying, you know, against gender violence. There are millions of African women who stay in a marriage simply because they don't know what to eat the following day if they leave that mar marriage. But if she is secure, that she can make a living for herself, making a living for her children, she will not tolerate anyone who will, again, come against her dignity. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the economy here, it's not per se an objective. It's a tool to what we have been saying, like empowerment. I don't like the word now because it has been overused. Mm -hmm. But it's a tool which allow a woman to stand with dignity and to be able not only for herself, for her family, at her workplace, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to, to stand as equal with anyone. You have to begin by being independent economically and financially. If you don't have that, many people will abuse you. And that's the point. So it's not like an objective by itself. It's a tool to achieve. That's why I said, for instance, financial inclusion. It's not an objective. It's because if you have the resources, then you will be able to use your creativity and your ability exactly to do more. And you grow. You are African women are not meant to be only poor or to be only in this small business. They have to do big business. That's what I tell my networks. And to say, you know, the present you are going to give to me when I'm retiring from retirement, the present <laughs> is for you to say, Mama, now I started small, but I'm big business. Yeah. That's the present I want for African women. Mama Grasa, if I could just uh, yeah. respond a little bit on that question, because I think that the idea of sort of complicating um, the challenges that women face is really saying, okay, we, we look at the case of Karabo, or we have yeah. um, some of these incidents, we're saying there are women who have access to enough food and enough economic empowerment, yet they are still being left out of many spaces and they're still facing uh, this violence. So how do we um, cater to them even while we cater to, to sort of the grassroots 
um, movement. That is true. Right. You know, uh, in any society when there is a transformative systems going on, you will find it those who resist. Most of those who are violent against young women like you, it's precisely because in that process you have gone up and they feel threatened. And the way they express their frustration, they can't communicate properly with you. The way they express themselves is to violate you. So we have a problem, and I, ha I am, I mean, a women's activist, is that we, 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 we put a lot of emphasis on girls only, and we don't put the same emphasis on boys. So boys feel challenged. Boys, they don't have the emotional maturity to accept, yes, the emotional maturity to accept that a girl who is educated, a girl who is professionally competent, a girl who moves up is equal to him. The moment some of them, I'm not saying all of you, okay? <laughs> but some of you, the moment a girl is, is, is climbing, right. instead of climbing with that girl, yes. they feel threatened, then they, and oh, they, yeah. they, they resort to violence. Yeah. So it's a part of uh, the strategy which we have been developing. It's not complete. Right. It has to go both ways. Right. It has to empower girls, but it also to address the issue of what it means masculinity today. Mm. Masculinity today, what does it mean? And we need, I would suggest that you begin to debate this amongst yourselves. <laughs> because it's true. Yes. Some of those who are doing this are not illiterate. Mm. It's not because they, are, don't, they don't have MBAs and they are not doctors and engineers, etc. Right. But exactly, that's why I'm talking about emotional maturity. And it's important. And questioning what masculinity it means in yeah. times where equality is developing. Right. Okay. Fantastic. Now, I think you did re respond. In your question, actually, you responded. One of the biggest problems with the uh, EFF mm. is that sometimes they have a, a valid point. They really have a valid point to raise. But you have to raise it with respect. You have to express yourself knowing that one, that gentleman has the age of being their father. Mm. Second, the, the, the position of a head of state, whether you like it or not, it's an institution by itself. And you need to respect the head of state. So you can put everything which they wanted to say about Nkantla, et cetera, et cetera, say exactly the same thing, but in a respectful manner, ask the questions, allow the president to reply. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't reply properly, ask again, mm -hmm. but you don't have to behave the way they behave. That's the problem. That's the problem. So you are right. So how do we do this? Well, perhaps I would put it back to you, young people. When you have a sense of, like them, for instance, they are parliamentarians already. I mean, they represent constituencies. They represent you, young people. Yeah. To say, when you get to that place, there is a code you have to respect. Because it is institutional, but it's also because you represent those who are behind you. And those who are behind you, certainly, they wouldn't behave the way they do in parliament. So that's the issue. And perhaps the conversation, and I think they are going on already behind the scenes, okay? They, they are people who are talking to them to say, okay, make your point, but it, don't behave like that. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Mama Grasa, this has been incredible. Thank you so much. I, I wish we could continue. Um, we've learned so much and uh, about, you know, African software, about femininity, masculinity, yeah. and, 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 and uh, really how we can actually apply uh, some of these skills to our day-to-day our, our -day lives and, and break frameworks. So I'm, I'm you know, so grateful. Uh, very so quickly, grateful. let me tell you yeah. one thing. You know, one of the things which we grew up, perhaps you two, I do not know, and you have to uh, discuss among yourself, is that because of this colonial stigma which we have, we, we, we tend to 
have our psyche already, Damn you know, yeah. damaged in a way we accept or we behave mm. like inferior. Yeah. I hope it's not happening with you. For us, it had to happen because we had to overcome it. Mm. We lived during the colonial era, mm. and then we have to overcome it. But in you, our expectation is that precisely because you didn't leave that period, mm. precisely because you have the knowledge and the tools you have, you will never, huh? listen to me, <laughs> you will never, never allow anyone to put the foot on top of your head. <laughs> as you hear me? Yeah. And I will be, I will be waiting <coughs> this association to develop a sort of a, perhaps a, I wouldn't call it a manifesto because it would be political. <laughs> a declaration, a declaration of the Africa we want. want. Okay? Yeah. I leave you with this theme. Amongst you, the Africa we want, which includes even how you are going to behave when you are in a position of leadership. Great. Ethical leadership. These things which you see of corruption, which many of my generation are doing, how do you arm yourself to lead yeah. ethically? Yeah. You lead for service, and you meet the deep aspirations of your people. Mm -hmm. So the Africa you want, and I'm, I'll be through Vivian, because she's the one who have been writing to my office. <laughs> so through Vivian, I will want to know whether you had that discussion and you have defined what is the Africa you want? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a guest? Where's our guest?